All right, so this morning we come to one of the most debated passages in all the Bible. Good luck. (laughs) Revelation 20 in the chapter of the millennium. This chapter records John, the vision of John who saw Jesus reigning with his saints for a thousand years. My message this morning is appropriately entitled, The Millennium. And and there's much controversy regarding the, the meaning of these words um, there, there are books written about it. In fact, I spent uh, much time this week in this book, The Meaning of the Millennium, Four Views, edited by Robert Klaus, where they present their view, and then those with other views then critique their views is, is really what they do um, throughout this book, and it's really quite uh, a lot. This text has been uh, kind of on my horizon for quite some time, spent a long time really thinking about it, praying about it. It is a What's Douglas Wilson said, it's the time of a thousand years of peace that Christians love to argue about. So I hope to put some clarity with things today. Well, I want to begin this morning by by reading from Revelation chapter 20. I want to read the first 10 verses. John writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. And a great chain, and he seized the dragon, that serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. And then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I want to begin this morning by simply telling you what John saw. Then I want to talk about its meaning and its application to us. And by the way, this has always been our reproach in Revelation. I just tried to just take the imagery and take the pictures there and just put them before you because what John saw is actually what he saw, what he wrote for us. Now, what it means then is another matter. But as we have done, we've done these various visions, whether it's the lampstands and the angels or the doors or the seals and the trumpets and the bowls or the the scrolls and the the stars and the beasts or the marks or the voices or the cities, right? We've seen them what John has seen. And then we step back to say, okay, what, it, what does it mean, and what does it mean for us? So first, I want to look at this question, what, what did John see? Well, I'm just going to walk through these 10 verses. That's what we're going to do. Then it's an angel coming down from heaven. There is. He saw an angel. It's not anything new for John. In fact, even if you look in chapter 18 and verse 1, there he saw another angel coming down from heaven. In fact, I count up 34 unique angels in the book of Revelation that John saw in his visions that he wrote down in, in, in his book here. And, and these aren't four, 34 appearances of the word angel. These are 34 angels, which th- they seem to be unique, uh, whether that's the seven angels over seven churches or the four angels holding back the four winds of the earth or the angel with the seal of the living God or the seven angels of the trumpet, like 34 of these angels. So it's nothing new. But we see this angel This is new of what he has. He's holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. Now, we've seen this pit before in chapter 9 when a star from heaven was fallen to earth and it was given the same key to open the bottomless pit. And when he opened it up, there was a big flume of smoke came rushing out of it. And locusts soon followed after that who had the power of scorpions. And these locusts were told not to harm the plants, which locusts normally do, but to torment people for five months. 
But in this instance, the key is not there to open up the bottomless pit. Instead, it's used to shut the pit and to lock it and seal it. Much like a, a prison lock would shut a, a prison door. In fact, it's called a prison in verse 7 when we get there. Now, this prison is only one inmate. It's the dragon. We see him, verse 2. And he sees that his angel, <clears throat> the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him. The imagery of the da- dragon takes us back to Revelation chapter 12. It's called the, the dragon. And in chapter 12, the dragon there is, is taken down to earth, seeking to devour the child that, that was born, that is Jesus, right? But Jesus was caught up after his resurrection, caught up to his throne into God. At that point, Michael and his angels fought the dragon and his angels, and the dragon was defeated, thrown down to earth again with his angels. And then listen to Revelation 12, verse 9, and the, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Note the description of of 12 verse 9 is very similar to that of of verse 2 here in Revelation. He's he's called the devil, the ancient serpent of old, the deceiver of the world. And in these three terms, right? The ancient serpent takes us back to Genesis 3, talking about the serpent who deceived Eve to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. And as Adam also ate, the world has been cast into sin. The term devil is used to identify the schemes of the dragon. The the Greek word for devil is diabolos. Literally means to to throw over, dia, like over, and balos, to throw, like a ball. And and that is what Satan does. He he divides. He accuses. He misrepresents. He deceives. And that's what the devil does. As it says in Revelation 12, verse 9, he's called the deceiver of the whole world. The word Satan is the dragon's name. And here in verses 2 and 3, we say, say, Satan is bound by this angel, and he is thrown into a pit, which is shut and sealed for a thousand years. Now, this is where we get the theological term millennium. A thousand years is a millennium. We are in the second millennium. Actually, we've started the, the third millennium, right? right? The first, yeah, We're starting the third millennium since Christ has lived. And this word, a thousand years is used six times in, in these nine verses as to make super clear how long John saw this serpent, devil, dragon, Satan in the pit. And the reason why Satan was in this bottomless pit was as clear as can be. Verse 3, that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. Satan is a deceiver. And we saw this in the garden when he came as a serpent, he deceived Eve. We see this in his title, devil, means slander or deceiver. And during these thousands of years, his seducing, deceiving ministry is curtailed. And during them, Satan is prevented, prevented from deceiving the nations as he has been doing ever since the days of Eden. Well, after the thousand years, it says here that he must be released a little while. So he's there, released a little while to engage once again in his deceiving ministry. In verse 4, then, the, the scene changes a bit. We see... From the bottomless pit, we see now focusing on thrones. We're not told how many thrones or who sat on the thrones, but we just simply said, I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. We don't know exactly what they're judging or how they're judging, or who's sitting on the throne. We just see these judged. We see that everything is set for judgment to take place. You're given authority to judge. They're not actually being talked about judging here yet. And then John continues in verse 4, And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. We see two groups of people here. We see martyrs, those who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, and we see faithful servants of Christ, those who had not worshipped the beast. The first description takes us back to Revelation chapter 6. When the fifth seal was broken, in chapter 6, verse 9, we read that the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne were under the altar. <clears throat> and these souls that were under the altar were crying out to the Lord, saying, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood with those who dwell on the earth? And these souls are what we call the intermediate state, the state that you're in after you die and before then, you're, you're reunited with the body to raise again with your resurrected body. 
And these souls, right, were longing for vindication of their martyrdom. How long will you judge until you judge and avenge? It says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Apparently, in Revelation 20, their waiting is over. It's when their blood was judged and avenged. And when it was, these souls, it says in verse 4, they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That is, they were resurrected. They received bodies and reigned with Christ. The, the second group of people in verse 4, not the martyrs, right, but those who are faithful followers of Jesus, are, are described as those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Now that takes us back to Revelation chapter 13, right, when, when the we saw the world taking the mark on their foreheads and on their hands and worshiping the beast. They were saying things like Revelation 13, 4. They were saying, who is like this beast? Who's like it, right? He's, he's to be praised and adored. And, and they received these marks on their hands and their foreheads, a symbol that they are worshiping the beast. But Revelation 13 tells us that not everyone on earth took the mark. There were those whose names are written before the foundation of the world in the book of life. These were the ones who's, who didn't take the mark. These were the ones who had the, their name of, of the Lamb and of the Father's name written on their foreheads instead. So it looks like in Revelation, everyone's going around with a mark on their foreheads, whether it's a mark of the beast or mark of the followers of Christ. Revelation 14 also describes them as those who sang a new song of worship to God. They're described as those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, Revelation 14.4. These are those who have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and for the Lamb. And presumably here by the time of Revelation 20, they died, whether well, it's a martyr by natural causes, because now they were resurrected. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This phrase then brings us back to Revelation 5 when they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain. And by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So here they are, raised up, reigning with Christ, victorious. It's what John saw. He saw the redeemed of the earth reigning with Christ. And verse 5 tells us that the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. And that is right, the first resurrection is the resurrection of believers, those who had worshipped the Lamb and refused the mark of the beast. And John here mentions this resurrection of the unbelievers, but they don't come to life until the thousand years were over. Then in verse 6, we hear the blessing. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And this is the blessing of belief. that, That we will share, you will share, if you trust in Christ, you'll share in the first resurrection. The second death will have no power over you. And the the second death is identified in in verse 14, which we won't look at today, but it's identified as the lake of fire. It's It's the death of final judgment. This is the second death, it says in verse 14, the lake of fire. If you raise that first resurrection, you won't die again in the lake of fire. And John here is saying that those who rise will never die again. So what Jesus promised to all who believe in him, right? Didn't he promise eternal life? John 3, 16, right? God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the promise here. We see that second death is not going to overtake them. And then in verse 7, we see a thousand years. Just skip forward. How we saw that, you know, uh, it was interesting that sometimes I've I've had struggles writing, uh, bringing pictures up here on the, the slides for you because... Uh, like even, even right here, the thousand years. This is more of a movie that he saw. He didn't just see the pictures. He saw a movie. And so he's got this movie somehow um, in this vision, thousand years released. And, and John saw that Satan had been in solitary confinement for a thousand years. And then he was released. And upon his release, Satan, like a, a gang member, went to join up with his gang as soon as he possibly could. Look at verse 8. He says, And Satan will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle, their number is like the sand of the sea. And note first how Satan comes to deceive the nations. This, this emphasis upon deception in chapter 12, and here is huge. 
It's what Satan was prevented from doing for a thousand years, and now he comes out to deceive the nations on the earth. And then like a gang member, as I said, Satan joins force with Gog and Magog to gather them together for battle. Gog and Magog takes us back to Ezekiel 38 and 39, where we see this great battle between Israel and her enemies. Israel's on the one side, and Gog and Magog are on the others. And the Lord God says in Ezekiel 39, verse 5, you shall fall in the open field. That's exactly what we read in verse 9. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they'll be tormented day and night forever. And here we meet the end of Satan, day and night, forever and ever. He'll be tormented with the beast and the false prophet in the lake of fire. That's what John saw. I just walked through those verses trying to explain them. And I, I trust you see just all the scriptures that, that, the, that the revelation brings in from all over, all over the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's what John saw. It's summing up, right? He saw Satan captured, thrown in a bottomless pit, spent a thousand years so he could not deceive the nations. John then saw the first resurrection where followers of Lamb came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then when the thousand years were over, saw Satan released from prison to deceive the nations, gather with its friend for battle, upon which soundly defeated, thrown in a lake of fire. That's like everything I said the last 15 minutes. So let's move on to my second point, what they say. This is what John saw, what they say. So here's we get to, by, by they, I mean the interpreters. I'm just talking about those people out there. What the, I could have said, point number two, what the interpreters say, but the nice parallelism would have been gone, right? What John saw, what they say, the interpreters is too many syllables. And essentially, here my second point, what I want to do is walk through the, the three major interpretive approaches to this passage. And to be honest, it's difficult to tell you which one of these is correct because there's difficulties with all of them. None of them line up nice and easily. I just trust the Lord will do His will as I, I share these with you. Okay, so three major interpretations. We have, first of all, we have premillennialism, and we have the amillennial interpretation and the postmillennial interpretation. Uh, there are more views than this. Uh, some, some divide two ways, like even this book I said, this is uh, the meaning of the millennium. Four views. So this has two premillennial views. One's a dispensational premillennial, one's a historic premillennial. Those are like sub, sub points. And there's, there's subtexts of postmillennial as well. Right? There's just different, different means. But basically, these are the three big ones that I think you can, can get in here. Notice the only thing different between these terms is the beginning. We have premillennial, amillennial, and post. We have pre, all, and post, and all these have a meaning. Pre means before, a means not, and post means after. Okay, we can see that good. Millennial means a thousand years, and each of these prefects have to do with the relationship with the coming of Christ and um, the thousand years. Premillennial means that Christ will come before the thousand years. Amillennial means that there is no millennium. That's what a means. It means, it means not. And postmillennial means that Jesus will come after the resurrection. Now, this isn't quite correct because the middle view, amillennialism, doesn't really believe there's not a millennium. Rather, it believes that there is a millennium now. There's a, a now millennium. Okay, those are the, the, the three views. And, and I, if I want to show them to you on a, on a timeline and, and address the pros and cons of each of the issues. Okay, so, um, you know, in Revelation, we've not pulled out a lot of timelines because I, I feel like you can understand and enjoy the pictures without understanding us all the timeline because a lot of it is, is difficult. But here, we like, we have to understand this for the different views. First off, there is premillennialism. So here's this timeline. There's, there's creation of the universe. God created the world in six days. And then as uh, time went on, um, nations flourished on the earth. God chose one man. He chose Abraham to bless him and to be the, the father of the family of Israel. And through him, God promised to bless the entire earth. And as time went on, God established a king over his people, that is King David, and promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he, his kingdom would know no end. And eventually, in Jesus, God brought both of those promises to fulfillment. Being a Jew, Jesus was descended from Abraham, and through Jesus, he brought a blessing through the entire nath, uh, to all the nations of the earth by providing salvation to all those who believe, to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. It was promised in Genesis 12. In you, all the nations of the earth be blessed, right? That is, in your seed, in Jesus, the Messiah, 
all the nations shall be blessed. Blessed through salvation, which comes through believing and trusting in Christ, who died on our sin, for our sins and rose on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Jesus was the promised Messiah. And, and his kingdom, the, the, the Messianic kingdom, will have no end. According to the promise of David, to David, 2 Samuel 7. And the promise comes to us. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trusting in King Jesus. There's time. It's been the true, like this way, for the past 2,000 years. Salvation is available to all who turn and trust in Christ. Now, as time continues on our, our line, here is where we begin to see the belief of the premillennialist. Right? Jesus will come before the millennium. So we see Jesus here returning and he establishes this millennial kingdom for a thousand years. This is premillennialism. He comes before the millennium. And then after a thousand years, then comes the final judgment and the eternal state. Now, among the premillennialists, there's, there's lots of discussion about how Christ returns. Just right there, all right? And lots of it, again, is speculation. I haven't been definitive about that in preaching through Revelation. And we won't talk about that red circle here today either. Okay, so there is uh, premillennialism, and basically what I presented in the first 10 verses of Revelation is premillennial. Uh, it is the natural reading of the scripture. Satan captured, thrown into the bottomless pit where he spends a thousand years. Um, following this, there's a first resurrection where followers of lamb come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And when a thousand years are over, Satan's released from the prison to deceive the nations and gather his friends for battle, upon which he's soundly defeated, thrown in the lake of fire, and then we have the final judgment. That's a premillennial position. Now, in many ways, I think it's the natural reading of the text. I, I think it, it is the, the belief of most of the early church fathers. They believed in premillennialism, Papias and Irenaeus and Tertullian. Many prominent theologians through history have believed this. John Gill, Charles Spurgeon, George Eldon Ladd, James Montgomery Boyce. Many modern-day theologians believe this. John MacArthur, John Piper, Al Mohler. But there are problems with this view. And first of all, it has to do with the beginning of the millennium. Right there, when Jesus returns, premillennialists believe that Revelation 20 comes after Revelation 19. Now, it does in your Bible, right? But there are some times where, where Revelation, like, is it, is it overlapping or how is it? But premillennialists believe that Revelation 19 and the details of the end of the world right, come before chapter 20. And, and, and in chapter 19, Christ comes in final victory with his final wrath. All his enemies are defeated and eaten by the birds. Remember that? That Jesus, my, my outline there, he, Jesus prepared for battle and then he fed the birds. And uh, all the followers we see in Revelation 19 are enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and if you remember a, a few weeks ago, like all who rebel against the Lord are dead. And their corpses are right there on the earth being eaten by the birds. So at the beginning of the millennium, there, there really aren't any nations left. They've all been destroyed. And yet we read in Revelation 20, verse 3, that Satan was thrown in the bottomless pit so he might just not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. But at the beginning of the millennium, they're like, no nations to deceive. They're all dead. This is difficulty in premillennialism, like what at the beginning of the millennium. Second, there's a problem with premillennialism at the end of the millennium as well. When Satan's released from his prison, we find the world in rebellion against the Lord. He goes and gathers Gog and Magog to prepare for battle. Now, it's conceivable in the millennium, the hardness of human hearts is such that even with Christ present and reigning with his followers, even with Satan being prevented to deceive any of the nations, that there still is rebellion. It's conceivable. So that when Satan's released, it wasn't his deceiving work that turned the hearts of the people, led them astray. Rather, it's desire, their own desires, sinful desires, led them in rebellion. That's okay. It's conceivable. But the problem with the end is this reference to Gog and Magog. If you look down in verse uh, 8, and uh, he gathers with Gog and Magog to gather them, battle, the, gather them for battle. So I, I reference, this is a reference to Ezekiel 38 and 39. When we read of Gog and Magog coming and making war with Israel. Sounds a lot like the, Revel, the war of Revelation 19. Listen to how the battle is described. Ezekiel 39, verse 4. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your hordes of the people who are with you, and I will give you to birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. The battle at the end of Revelation 20 sounds a lot like the battle at the end of Revelation 19. 
And they're both the battle of Gog and Magog. Maybe there are two battles. I'm not exactly sure. I just know that this is sort of a, a problem with the beginning and the end. Uh, there's also a third difficulty. The millennium is never spoken about in all the New Testament, except for Revelation 20. That's a problem. I did a bit of research, my preaching at Rock Valley Bible Church. Our first meeting at Rock Valley Bible Church, July 2nd, 1998, we had a Bible study in a basement in a house here in Rockford, and there were 14 people at that meeting. And the reason why there were so many people is because we had quite a few visitors come up from DeKalb at that very first meeting. Um, and we, we met there, that was more than 25 years ago, we met for the first time. After two years of meeting in a home, we rented a church for Sunday night. After two years of renting that church on Sunday night, we then rented Rockford Christian for about 10 years, and we purchased this building about 10 years ago. And, and I, so I've essentially been preaching week in, week out for about 25 years. And I preached, I calculated this week, about 1,000 sermons. Uh, I've preached from the Old Testament, verse by verse, through books of the Bible like Leviticus and Ruth and Jonah, Habakkuk, Malachi, along with a bunch of psalms and and periodic passages dropped there. I have preached verse by verse through more than half of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Acts, Romans, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, Philemon, Hebrews, 1 2 Peter, 1 2 3 John, and soon, Revelation, I'll, I'll be all, all done with that. And I have all my sermons on the computer. I, I manuscript everything I preach. Everything I'm saying here, I, I've got written down here, even though it might not look like I'm reading and I'm, I'm really reading it most of the time. So, now I, I look down to read, right? And I searched all of my sermons for the term millennium. You know how many times in 25 years of preaching I have used the word millennium? What do you might guess? Two, four times. Four times in 25 years I've used, I, I used it in uh, preaching on 2 Peter 3, the day of the Lord. I point out there's no mention of the millennium in this passage. Okay, there's one time. I preached on 12 stages in the Bible, talking about missions, referring to the Bible. I know the millennium wasn't included in this great book because of the controversy probably surrounding the topic. That's the second time. The third time I mentioned it was in a sermon called Accept One Another. And I stated, that was from uh, Romans 15, um, in stating the Apostles' Creed is clear on the essential of the Christian faith. I spoke how it spoke nothing of the millennium. And then my fourth time, I spoke a sermon called Resurrection in Revelation. It was an Easter sermon. And I pointed out the difficulty interpreting Revelation, and I posed a, a bunch of questions about the difficulty of interpreting them, and one of, this, one of the questions was this, what exactly is the millennium? Those are the four times in 25 years of preaching I've ever talked about the millennium. And I think it's a sign, because I, I eminently try to be so textual, what's in the text, let it come out. I mean, you, you know, I've been here, like, well, it's in, it's just not in the New Testament. It's just not there, and so I haven't felt need to bring it up. The New Testament says nothing about the millennium until Revelation 20. That, that's a problem. So we've got the beginning and the end and even no mention of the millennium. Now, it may be, though, that the millennium is a bit like the church. You will search the Old Testament in vain to find any reference to the church. The church was a mystery in the Old Testament. Listen to Ephesians 3, 4 through 6. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In other words, if you're an Old Testament preacher, preach through faithfully the Old Testament, right? some rabbi in the synagogue, verse by verse, uncovering every other stone, he would preach the whole thing and never would have preached about Jew and Gentile together in one body in the church. It may be that's the same way with the, the millennium and that we may be in it and be surprised. Oh, I didn't know this was talking about. It's like a mystery, like the church is a mystery. It may be. It may be that we live in some new age where Christ is reigning among us and that this thing was hidden in the New Testament but then has come to light with the second coming of Jesus. Maybe. All right, let's move on to talk about all millennialism. Uh, same sort of deal. We got the creation of the world, Abraham, David, Christ, and we're coming up to 2024. And because amillennialism seeks to solve the problems of premillennialism, about the beginning of the millennium, the end of the millennium, and even the silence of the New Testament. And, and it does it in this way. R rather than waiting for Christ to come to establish a millennium, amillennialists believe that we are in the millennium. So it would look like, like this. Now, your first inclination here is to say, <laughs> this, this is hardly what the millennium looks like. I, 
right, with all these troubles we have with wars and sin, I would just say that that's because what you view the millennium is a preconceived perception of what premillennialists view the millennium and trying to pull it back. Rather, what the all millennialists say is that it's a different sort of, of, of millennium than you might think. The all millennialist believes that it is a spiritual millennium where Christ is ruling in the hearts of his people who've been made alive together with Christ. And, and regarding then the return of Christ, I'm just going to push it out there, like just whatever, it's 2024, and maybe push it out there just so it matches up with the other slide is really what it did. The animal Ennis believes that Jesus will return at the end of the age and bring in the final judgment and usher in eternity. So don't get confused by the pictures, right? Thinking that Christ's coming back is way off in the future. Maybe it's 2020, maybe it's the end. We, we don't know where that is. But the amillennialists will believe that we are in the millennium at this time. Now, there's many through church history who believe this. Augustine believed this. Many of the reformers believe this. Calvin and Luther did. Great theologians, Herman Bavink, Louis Burkhoff, Gerhardus Voss, R.C. Sproul. You probably only recognize R.C. Sproul, but if you're a, a, a theologian, you would recognize those other names as stalwarts in the faith. In recent days, Joel Beakey, Kevin DeYoung, Sam Storms, all believe this. All men I follow, all men I, I trust. All millennialism helps to solve the problem, the beginning and the end, and the silence of the New Testament of the millennium. It does so by interpreting Revelation as a series of retellings this, the same story from different perspectives. And I trust that you remember the slides when I told you the backbone of Revelation is the seals and the trumpets and the bulls. You, you've seen this many times. You have Revelation chapter 6 are the seals, and then 8 and 9 are the trumpets, and chapter 16 are the bulls. And there are actually seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. And each of these represent God's judgment in increasing severity as the seals are open and the trumpets are blown and the bowls are poured out, just getting worse and worse all the time. Now, some view Revelation as a series of, of sequential events. I have another book uh, I looked at even this week that said four different views on the book of Revelation. So, like, here would be one. Like, some would view all the seals, trumpets, and bowls in sequential the second bowl comes after the first bowl, and the first trumpet comes after the seventh seal, and the second trumpet, and all the bowls come after the seventh trumpet. Um, some, however, view this as sequential, like I'm putting it under, like I put that, so they're all, they're all kind of happening at the same time. The seals and the trumpets and the bowls are all, are all happening at the same time, unless you be confused, oops, unless you be confused. Um, here, here we come. I, I, I crunched this slide up one time, I remember that, like... Like, the, the seals are bad, but the trumpets are worse, and the bowls are worse. And so I kind of, like, pushed them towards the end and tried to show there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with them, but there is an, an, an overlapping with them. I think there's a lot of credibility in that as you look finally at, at the text, as they increase intensity. Now, those above the line mostly represent premillennialists, particularly dispensational premillennialists, who would place the millennium, right, sometime after the the bulls, like, like, like right there. But there are, and, and mostly all millennialists then would, would place the millennium down here, like during the time of, uh, of the church, right? Just as, as these judgments later then would, would be poured out. However, there are some premillennialists who would see the seals, trumpets, and bulls overlapping, would place the millennium and the seals, trumpets, and bulls after all these are finished. These are called historical premillennialists. Okay, but getting back to our picture today, here we have, we see that all millennialists believe the nature of a thousand years as described in Revelation 20 describes the church today. We're, 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 we're made alive in Christ through faith in, in Jesus. And where Christ rules and reigns in our hearts. And that thousand year reign here is, is symbolic, which I'm totally fine with. And going through Revelation, um, there's been so many different references to so many different numbers and, and symbols. I'm okay with a thousand meaning just a long time. In this case, it's 2,000 years. I'm okay with that. I have no problem with seeing that as symbolic at all. Um, one of the things that the millennium helps do is solves the problem at the beginning of the millennium um, by understanding Jesus bound Satan during the days of his ministry. And they would say that that's when he was bound, right then, to the state of his ministry. And it solves the problem at the end of the millennium by understanding the final coming to be the time of all-out war, like Revelation chapter 19 hits. And Revelation 19 are overlapping, so they're describing the same event, and so that happens right there at the same time. It also solves the problem of the absence in the New Testament mentioning the millennium because 
Revelation 20 and mentioning just a thousand years is sort of like another name for the church age, like another name for the church. And so that's okay to bring up a, a new term in this sense that just describes going to be a long time. However, solving these problems cause other problems with the amillennial position. First, there's a problem in, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, where we read that Satan was bound in the bottomless pit so that, verse 3, he might not deceive the nations any longer. In other words, during the entire church age millennium, where we are now, it means that Satan cannot deceive the nations. It seems to me the nations are quite deceived. And the scripture even speaks about how the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Um, Sounds a lot like Satan is deceiving people today. Furthermore, 1 Peter 5.8 talks about Satan roaming around like a roaring lion seeking someone he can devour. It's hard to roam around like a roaring lion when you're in solitary confinement, bound. Now, the Amalinists try to get around this by redefining and narrowing the focus of the term deceiving the nations. Say, well, this is something that um, he, he, he's bound, right, but he still can, right, he still is, is able to do that, no, or just deceiving the nations, right, to put it in a real narrow place. But it, it fails to the parallel story in Revelation chapter 12, which tells the story of, of Satan being cast down to earth after Jesus escaped his grasp. So Jesus is thrown down to earth, not into the bottomless pit, and when he's thrown down to earth after the cross, right when the time when the amillennials say there's the Satan in the, uh, the bottomless pit, he says the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He's thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And in that passage, we see Satan free to roam and free to deceive the nations that I think he's doing today. So verse 3 is a problem for amillennialists. Uh, verse 4 is a problem for amillennialists where we read, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The amillennialists will say that these words are talking about the spiritual reality of all believers. Not a physical resurrection, but a, a spiritual resurrection. And Paul talked about that. We're being dead in our sins but being made alive in Jesus. The difficulty here is that those being made alive are already alive in Jesus. They're the ones who had been martyred for Jesus, the souls on the altar. Uh, Secondly, these are the ones who had not worshipped the beast. And so they were very much alive spiritually before anomalous would have them coming to life spiritually, but they're already alive. But the souls pleading for God to judge their case Um, were very much alive, they just didn't have their body, but the resurrection then speaks about the body. Furthermore, the the New Testament never speaks about resurrection as anything other than resurrection from the dead. You just can't find it. Always bodily resurrection. So those are two big textual problems that the amillennial has. Solves the problem at the beginning and the end and no mention of millennium, but has the problems of these two verses, of verse 3 and verse 4. And I just say this, as I prepared Revelation, I have been most helped easily by far by the amillennialists. They are far more textual, far more sensitive to the way that Revelation works in its apocalyptic literature, far more helpful than the premillennialists. I just tell it out there. But then they come to Revelation chapter 20, and I don't know what happens. Chapter, verse 3 and verse 4 are difficult, difficult problems. They do some dancing here in, in this chapter. All right, so we've seen the premillennial view. We've seen the problems with that. We've seen the amillennial view. We've seen problems with that. And now the postmillennial view And this view is much the same as the amillennial view in that it sees the millennium in our day and age. And depending upon your variety of post-millennialism, the millennium may have began or it may begin sometime in the future. But it's different than the amillennialism in in that it, it doesn't so much try to spiritualize the millennium as much as the millennium is the time in which Christ comes to rule and reign. A post-millennialist could say, oh, that's going to be a thousand years, right? We don't know exactly when it begins, or maybe there's a time when it begins. They could say it could be a thousand years. They could, they could say right there, they could say Jesus is coming right down here uh, on the earth. Um, some have called it the age, the golden age of Christianity. And the gospel's been so successful that the entire world becomes followers of Jesus. And it's post-millennial because the millennium actually like ushers in the eternal state. So as, as things get better upon the earth, as, as people like come to Christ in, in droves, then Jesus will come at the end of the millennial kingdom. Not to set up his kingdom, but basically to judge. Many Puritans believe this. 
Jonathan Edwards believe this. Other great theologians like B.B. Warfield, Lorraine Bettner believe this. There are those today who believe it, Doug Wilson and Greg Bonson. And, and, and I think one of the reasons why people believe this is because they believe, well, the main reason people believe this is because they believe the power of the gospel and they believe many of the promises of the Old Testament that Christ and God and Messiah will rule and reign. But I think also it's because they've seen power in their day. Jonathan Edwards saw a great revival in, in his day. Like, like he was just kind of going along and preaching his same old dull sermons, and um, God came down. And massive revival in the first great awakening, many conversions, and the gospel moved. And Jonathan Edwards saw that and said, if God moved here, he can move everywhere just like that. Douglas Wilson has seen great revival in Moscow, Idaho. Moscow, Idaho is a small city up in, up in Idaho, it's a population of 25,000. The church, Christ Kirk, Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho, has like 1,500 people at it. And he's seen, Douglas Wilson has, just, just the church grow and be, and be powerful. Big church, huge church in a small town. They've seen the power of the gospel in their local context. And there's no reason not to believe that this gospel can go and flourish. So when you see an, a, a post-millennialist, believe, just look at that person and say, that person believes and trusts in the power of the gospel to go and prevail. Now, there are subsets. Now, some people who are post-millennial... Um, can be of the kind that says, okay, we need to bring, bring God's laws back into it. We need to have this Christian, right? We need to really work in the government, right? We need to get all these people, and we need to, like, set up Christian laws and develop this Christian nation and become, actually, they're, what they're doing is they're, they're bringing in a kingdom with ways that Christ never advocated the coming in the kingdom. There's some post-millennials say, no, it's the gospel's going to do it. We need to keep on preaching, keep on teaching about Christ, and the church will grow. So the kind of different splinters there in post-millennialism. But it's not merely sociological reasons why post-millennialists believe it. There are plenty of Bible verses that talk about the power and reign of Christ on the earth. In Psalm 72, Solomon is praying for Christ to have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Psalm 72, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 2 speaks about the righteousness and peace of the kingdom, which will be there. The parables of the kingdom, Jesus described the kingdom of mustard seed and leaven, which will grow and expand into something far larger than was ever expected. Now, those might just be descriptions of heaven. Those might just be descriptions of the day in the eternal state, or that kind of a picture of what things would be like. But Jesus has all authority to make disciples of all the nations. He certainly can do this if he would like to. And it helps to describe the binding of Satan, right? This view does. As the, the power of the kingdom progresses more and more in the future, it's because Satan is being suppressed and he can't deceive the nations anymore. And, and, and they're, they're going on believing. Yet the same difficulty, the the amillennialists, the postmillennialists share the first resurrection in amillennialism is difficult in postmillennialism as well. Postmillennialists say that the millennial saints come to life when they believe phys- spiritually and not physically, and that's a difficulty, Revelation 20, verse 4. And furthermore, there are some sociological difference, difficulties with postmillennialism. We don't see the world getting better. Postmillennialism was, was popular early, early 1900s until the First World War hit, until the Second World War hit. And then you just see things that things are not getting better. They're not getting worse. And furthermore, we read in Scripture that Jesus says there are few who will be saved. He didn't speak about many be saved. You look at all his parables. The most important parable of the kingdom is in Mark chapter 4 where the sower spreads the word. And some reject it. Others kind of receive it. And, but then the worries of the world or the anxieties or the deceitfulness of riches, they, they fall away. But there's only one, one in four. With a good word who grows forth. And Jesus says, if you don't understand this parable, how will you receive, how will you not understand all? How are you to understand all the parables of the kingdom? Like that's the most important one. The seed goes out and most people are going to reject it. That's what Jesus' message was. There are few who are going to be saved. And Paul said in the last days come time of difficulty and hardship. Not in the last days are going to become a great glory Christ kingdom. It says men will go on from being bad to worse, from deceiving and being deceived. All right. There we go. We have premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, and they all have problems. Every single one of them. And I'm not convinced that we can know and solve these problems. I'm content just saying, okay. That's how it is. If you want me to lean any place, I will lean premillennial. Because it's just plain scripture reading in the text. It has problems. How it's going to begin and end and no word. But that's okay. My last point here this morning is, so, what we do. What John saw, what they say, and what we do. Here's the application. 
What should we do of all this? Um, I think, first of all, we, we don't divide. Don't divide over a millennial view. Um, there are some doctrines which we can divide upon, okay? Uh, if you don't believe the Trinity, uh, you divide upon that because you're blaspheming the name of Christ who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. You divide on the atonement. You divide on the, the, the shed blood of Christ. Right. You, you divide on these things. But it's interesting about all these views, premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial, they all believe in the physical return of Jesus. And in that, we can say amen, absolutely. They all believe in judgment, so absolutely that we can say amen. And, and I, I think that really, I, I've really thought long and hard. So, okay, so what difference does it make practically whether you're a premillennialist or an amillennialist or a postmillennialist? I couldn't come up with anything. As long as you are sincerely hoping and trusting and praying as Revelation does, right? This is our theme. Come, Lord Jesus. If you are praying that, all of them say that. An amillennialist, a premillennialist, postmillennialist will say this and pray this and long for Christ to come. And with the longing for Christ to come, there is a sanctifying effect upon your life. When we see him, we'll be like him. When we see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. There's a sanctifying effect in, in longing for the return of Christ, whether we're premillennial, amillennial, or, or, or postmillennial. I, I don't think we should divide on this. I have tried as a, as a pastor to preach to you the things which are clear and the things which are unclear, not to make a clear, strong, dogmatic stand. I trust that we all will do that as well. As Christ has accepted us, so we ought to accept one another. We ought not to divide on millennial views. But second, ought what we to do is we ought to look for the return of Christ. I mean, that ought to be the longing. Whether we are longing for him to come and set up this kingdom, whatever the problems of that is, or whether we think that he's ruling and reigning now and then it's going to come the end, we need to, to long for that as well, or whether we long for this come great gospel time in the future, we can long for that as well. I mean, what, what better thing would it be if postmillennialism was right? That the gospel comes and the gospel triumphs and we become Christian nation, we become a Christian world, and everybody in their hearts and in their minds, in their souls, are worshiping King Jesus, bringing that, that would be great. I find difficulty that's going to be good. But I, I'm okay with that. And if amillennialism is true, as, by the way, if you look at um, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus preached in a way that was amillennial, for sure. He spoke at the end of the time, the angels are going to come and they're going to gather everybody and, the, and these are going to throw in the barn and then these are going to be burned and then the end will come. And so if amillennialism is true, we're right in line with just Jesus was. And if premillennialism is true, that means that there's a coming kingdom where we're with Christ for a thousand years on the earth. What a wonderful thing. Everything is, is there. We just don't know what exactly it's going to be. And I'm not sure there's enough information in the Scripture to definitively say that. And I'm not going to defend and argue and split over those things. But I am going to long for the return of Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. One of the ways we can long for Jesus is through the Lord's Supper. And this season of Lent is an opportunity for us each week to celebrate the, the Lord's Supper together. One of the things that Paul said after speaking about how Jesus said the night when he was betrayed, right, this is my body broken for you in the cup, this is a cup for the new covenant of my blood. He said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whether that's before he comes premillennially, whether he comes, has already come, amillennially, and you're going to come to judgment, or whether he's going to come postmillennially, all those ways. And, and maybe it would have been nice if Jesus, if Paul would have included one word, until he comes amillennially, right? It doesn't, the Bible doesn't do that. But we just have this hope, and Christ will come, and every time we take the bread and drink the cup, we're saying this, my hope is in Jesus. This is my hope, and I'm going to continue to do that until Christ comes. And in that way, I think that's what we should do. We should look forward to the coming of Christ. And, and this, this bread and the cup that we eat and we drink together is a proclamation. says, I'm looking for that day. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And until he comes, we're going to proclaim the Lord's death. It's true in my life. I'm trusting him. I'm believing in him. He's my only hope. He's my only joy. He's my only righteousness. His steadfast love is better than life. And that's what I'm trusting in. And if that's where your heart is, where your soul is, then the supper is for you. So let's pray. 
Oh, Father, what a difficult text this is and how hard it is to understand. I pray that we would hold the views we have, God, with grace and favor upon with, with other people, that we would God, know you and trust you. We'd be gracious to others. God, we just know that you're going to come, and you're going to come and, and set things right in only the way that you know that you will come. And we have hardships and difficulties in understanding, and it's not because there are errors in the Bible or contradictions in the Bible. It's because we don't understand. Maybe there's a, a fourth view that's entirely different that we haven't grasped. God, but we do trust in you. And I would pray now, even as we eat this bread and drink this cup, I, got, I pray, God, that you would help us do as Paul said. Proclaim your death until you come again. I pray that the longing of Messiah of Revelation would be in our hearts, that we would long for your coming, that you, we would pray, come, Lord Jesus, when we can stop eating the bread and, and, the, and the cup, which is the rehearsal dinner for the marriage supper. We can eat the marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, I pray for that day. May you be with us now as we think about our, our life, think about our sins, think about our trust in Christ as we eat and drink together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.